got one more example for you just so you can see kind of a real world example of merging data. And we've talked a lot about trending on data and on merging data. Um, and so, you know, let's, let's show you the money here, okay? Um, so this is a, an example that we've worked on that's um, currently under review. Um, that's a multi-cycle example that we we've used to evaluate some of the Healthy People 2020 goals. As Dr. Hesse alluded to earlier, HINTS is often used and called upon by other agencies and other initiatives to help monitor trends over time. Um, and this is one such example. So we'll start off talking about how we used HINTS to monitor Healthy People 2020 goals and why we did that. Um, we'll talk about, in terms of the actual nuts and bolts that you can take away yourself from this example, how to merge cycles to trend on specific items of interest. Um, how do you actually go in and test the modes? Dr. Moser gave a great uh, talk about how to, how, why you would want to assess mode differences and how you would start with that. I'm actually going to show you the data and walk you through annotated code. Um, and I'm happy to make that available to anyone and the merge code available to anyone who wants to just contact me via email afterward. I'll send you the text file. Um, and finally, options for dealing with significant differences in mode if you find that there is a difference in mode. And finally, um, this will be kind of, this is not hints endorsed, this is my personal, I'm going to give the not NCI representative, my personal tips and tricks for managing your analyses so you don't go crazy. Because when you start to get into the data and you start to play in that playground, you can get lost very quickly in the sandbox. So before I, you know, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, tell you, and then tell you what I told you here, because it's the easiest way to handle this. It's kind of a tricky merge um, process. So the first thing you're going to do, there's five steps to merging and doing analysis with this cycle. The first is to create formats for your variables of interest if you need to. As I said earlier, um, if you're doing uh, your outcome variables coded as one and two in hints, um, with some software packages, you're going to want to recode it to zero and one so you don't get error messages. You're going to import and format each cycle's data um, ind individually. And that's usually the point at which that I stop and say, OK, let's take a look at mode differences if we're using hints, like, uh, hints administration three. Um, and at that point, you've had everything brought in, and you can really, it, it makes it a lot easier at that point. So that's just my preference. You can, if you want to do it right after you bring in HINTS 3 into your program, you're welcome to do so. Then you finally, yay, get to merge the data set, and then you finally run the analyses. So the context of this, and I, I'm very excited. I think it's incredibly cool that we have this great resource to monitor, monitor public health trends. Um, the mission of Healthy People 2020, for those who aren't unfamiliar, is to provide science-based 10-year national objectives for improving the health of all Americans. And some of these goals, um, my particular area of interest is health information technology and patient-reported outcomes. And they have objectives, they call them objectives, I say goals, I know that's poo-pooed on, but I say goals, um, for improving the health of um, all Americans through technology. Um, and what we really decided to do, and what we, I say the royal we, the HINTS team, um, pre-me, um, decided to use hints in conjunction with uh, the Healthy People 2020 team to monitor these specific trends. Um, and so that's actually been called upon formally to help monitor. So the goal that I'm going to share with you today was to increase the number of individuals who contact their provider via email. And the target was set as 15% of the general population by 2020. And the baseline was set using that <laughs> the infamous HINTS 3 data was set at 13.6% and aimed for, bless you, a 10% improvement um, by 2020. And the HINTS item specifically was, in the last 12 months, have you used email or the internet to communicate with your doctor or a doctor's office? And if we went back to the website and did our due diligence, you know, I'm trying to walk the walk here. It, you know, you see, you can pull it up and see that it was asked in five of the cycles. So, skipped HINTS 4, cycle 2, and HINTS 4, cycle 4, and you can see that we can access the related articles and briefs if we want to. But we see that we have HINTS 3 involved, so that means we're going to have to pump the brakes a little bit. So I'm going to walk you through each of those five steps. The first of the five steps is to import and format each cycle's data. And what I've put up here is just a, a snippet of the import that I did for this project for HINTS cycle 1, You'll keep it, or HINTS administration 1, excuse me. You'll have to do this for each of the seven individually, or each of the ones that you're using. So you typically start by importing the data and format file, and then you create formats. And as you can see here, our variable of outcome is, I'm calling it email doc, and the format I'm calling email docf, that's just a name. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Um, and I'm recoding it as 1 is yes, and zero is no because it's going to be my outcome variable and I don't want to get any, any errors from, uh, from the uh, code run. 
then you're going to create serve year, which is the survival year variable that um, Dr. Moser mentioned. So basically, to create this within each um, each cycle or each administration, you're going to just say serve year equals, and for hints one, I called it one, hints two, I called it two, et cetera. I go all the way up to seven if I'm using all seven cycles. Um, and that just makes it really easy to do some comparative analyses within between cycles. And also, I'll show you, it makes it very easy to do subset analysis if you come up with an idea down the road and don't want to create a whole other merge data set. Um, and finally, you recode. So here for hints one, we can see that eight and nine, um, that very last code, I know it's small font, I apologize, um, says um, the eight and nine were missing or incomplete. And so we recoded those as missing. Then we format um, the, the variables of interest and you run it. Um, and so you do that for all the cycles and administrations. But then after you've done that, I typically, as I said, like to stop at that point and say, let's check for mode differences. And this is going to be a bit redundant to what Dr. Moser said earlier, but I, um, I'm a visual person, so I thought I'd give you a different way of visualizing um, the issue of HINTS 3. So HINTS 3, you can see here, um, about 3,600 respondents uh, responded via mail and about 4,100 via telephone. So if you're doing analyses and you're using HINTS cycles, one, or excuse me, I see this is, we, even, we have our own trouble with our own terminology sometimes. HINTS administrations 1 through 3. Um, you're, and you're only restricting to those three. You're going to use your. You're going to restrict to just those 4,100 who responded via telephone, and you're going to use your uh, random digit dial weights or R weights. You can see at the bottom. So you're only really going to use that half of your hints three respondents. If you're using hints administration three and then hints four, um, you're going to restrict similarly to the 3,600 or so who responded via mail and use your mail weight. Um, so again, you're cutting that hints three and a half, and then you're only using the mail weights for that particular one. And then if you have hints three in the middle of it, and you're kind of stra your item straddles both sides, what you're going to do is you're going to test to see if you can use the combined weights, which if you can use the combined weights, you're in the clear. It makes your life very easy. If not, you're going to have to do two separate parallel analyses, as Dr. Moser alluded to. So how do you check for mode differences? We've talked a lot about this. This is actually what the code looks like. So you'll bring in hints three, so you've, had, you've already imported it, you'll call it up, and then you'll array the mail and phone weights. And as Dr. Moser mentioned, it's kind of like stacking the weights, except you're doing like a mini stack here to do your test. So you're going to say, okay, I'm going to do stack the mail weights and the random digit dial weights. So that's what you see. Oh, sorry, can I get this? Yes, you see that up. Oops, I can't even see my own screen here. Um, but what you can see is that you, then you'll do the total weight. So you do as same code that um, Dr. Moser used, T weight 1 through T weight 100, and that combines those two. So you're stacking them into one. Then there's a variable within hints 3 that's called stamp flag, and that denotes whether or not the respondent was a male respondent or a phone respondent. And so you're going to take that and use that to assign um, the correct mail weights or telephone weights to that individual respondent. Um, just as uh, Rick showed you, you kind of stack it up and, and then assign things so that it will zero out um, all the other weights and use the appropriate weights. And then finally, you, you run a t-test, really, of a differences in, in mode for your specific variable of interest. So there's two different ways that I like to look at this. You, can, you get your output, and you look at your p-value. And here at this example, it's borderline statistic, uh, statistically significant, 0.0536. Um, I will say that with hints, because of the um, number of respondents and, and the way the items are structured, you do tend to get, well, not tend to get, but you do often get statistically significant um, outcomes. But the question is, does this matter in the real world? If the n is large enough, anything is going to be statistically significant. So I tend to take that and then put that in context with the actual weighted percentages. So what I do is I calculate the weighted percentage for the male respondents and the telephone respondents separately and the combined. And my rule of thumb, again, this is not, this is my personal opinion, my personal approach, um, is if it's within 2 to 3 percent of each other, I say, you know, and it's not like within the single digit percentage, it's not like 3 and 7, if here it's uh, 12 and 14.6, I typically say, you know, that's, that's close enough to use the combined weights without saying it's going to have a huge impact on the interpretation and, uh, and uh, implementation if it were to be used in a real world situation. So in short, you look at the weighted percentages themselves in each mode um, for your variable of interest. And if it's drastically di different and you do that kind of eyeball test, you have to do the two separate analyses. So you'll do that restriction like I showed you with that chart. You'll do just one through three for, mail, for excuse me, telephone. You'll do three through all of hints four. 
for um, the mail survey. Um, and if you visualize this, um, you'll actually have two trend lines. So a trend line that starts at one and ends at three, and then you'll have a separate point for three, and so a start at three, and you'll go through to um, seven or whatever your um, ending cycle of choice is. And you'll have to present those in your manuscript as two separate analyses and explain, you know, it was significantly different. The percentages were enough that we were concerned. And conversely, if you choose to use um, the combined weights because it's minimal, you can say, you know, it was statistically significant mode difference, but then we looked at it and we made the judgment call that for policy or implications or what have you, it did not make a huge difference. But you do need to make sure you put that verbiage in there. So finally, um, you get to merge your data, hurrah, after all of that. So you create your data set and you call all the relevant data sets that you want to merge. You array the weights for each individual data set. And as Dr. Moser said, you're really just stacking it and almost creating like one new, I think of it as one new variable that's all your weights combined. Um, and what I'd like to point out here is, you know, we've said over and over, hints kind of grows and changes over time. You can see that the way that the weights are named has changed over time. So make sure you go back to the analytic recommendations in your code book to make sure you're using it using the right term because you can see it's F weight 1 through 50 for hints, uh, hints 1. And then it changes to person underscore fin weight 1 for hints uh, 4 cycle 3. So you need to make sure you're calling the right thing into your um, weighting file. Then what you're going to do is this is where part of where your serve your variable comes in that really helps is you're going to say, okay, if serve, you're going to, for each cycle, you're going to say if serve your equals, you can see if serve your equals one, then you're going to do an if then do statement, and you're going to call that up. And what this is really doing, and again, I'm happy to share this code with anyone, just contact me afterward, um, is you're going to create it such that each of the weights, let's see if I can, uh, I'm, I'm not I'm tethered here, but you can see, whoop, 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 come back. Um, so you can see that each of the weights, um, where did I put them? Yeah, they're, they're going to be zeroed out. So you have F weight here. And what's that's supposed to be itself, F weight minus F weight. It's going to zero itself out, I believe. Um, and so that way what will happen is you'll only call in the relevant weights. So you can see here that first we put in H03 weights, which is our array for hints 1. And we do the same on the next line for hints 2. And you just lather, rinse, and repeat to get through all of your um, different cycles. Um, and after that, once you've gone through, gone through that, and like I said, and, and like Dr. Moser said, once you have this merge set, once you this is the painful part. <laughs> once you've done this, you can really just work off of it and modify it. Um, and I'll show you how to subset without having to create a new data set momentarily. Um, but you go through all of this to make sure you have the accurate uh, jackknife weighting. And you assign the formats and run. And there you got your data set. And from there, it's pretty straightforward. It's like any other um, analyses that you would do with these data. Um, just in terms of approach, I typically like to do um, a bivariate or unadjusted logistic regression analysis. Um, this code here is for South Callable Sudan. Um, like I said, for me, that's my, my choice because it makes it very easy, as Dr. Moser said, to call in some SAS codes and then you can switch over to Sudan without doing separate software. It makes it very easy. Um, so I typically do a crosstab or um, an rlogis command um, for, an, uh, for a model that just has the outcome and the depend or the outcome and the independent variable of interest. And then I typically after that will run the adjusted uh, logistic regression. There's a couple things I want to point out in here that I, I think are fairly handy. Um, the first is, as I said, you can subset. So if you don't want to create, if, let's say we had gone back, this only used five cycles for this merge. Let's say you had merged all seven and then you only wanted to look at data from these five. You would do a sub pop x statement like this. And that basically cuts it out and cuts out all the weights and does all the work for you so you don't have to go through all of that that we just went through to create a new data set. It's very handy. Um, it used to be sub pop n, but that didn't accommodate all of the um, analyses that you can do. So we have a new statement, sub pop x, that lets you do absolutely everything you could want to do. The other thing, that's, um, as, as Dr. Moser alluded to, you can look at interactions. Um, and this is fairly easy. As long as you have the vari both variables on your class statement and your model statement, um, you can just put an asterisk between and you'll get the, um, the interaction uh, output as well. Uh, and finally, and I didn't highlight this, but the very last line before run is a pred marge. And what you can do is actually get the predicted marginals, or um, I kind of think of them as the population estimates across time or across the survey year. And that's typically what we like to use to um, put on our graphs and, and trends. Um, and when we publish our manuscripts, we're using trends and data. 
So to put this all back in context um, and, and give you the punchline, you're not going to walk away with just code, you're going to walk away with this cool new finding, was that um, we're doing really well. Um, target was 15% by 2020, and we actually have already doubled it as of 2014 with an estimated U.S. population usage of, 24, of 30%. So 30% of individuals now say that they have emailed their clinician or a healthcare provider in the past 12 months, which is great. Um, we did see that race, gender, education, and income were significantly uh, correlated with this, this use of email feature um, through, be it through portals or what have you, um, with a healthcare provider. And uh, that really speaks to the fact that the digital divide is continuing to be pervasive throughout health technology, not just technology in general. Um, so to conclude, I wanted to share some of my personal tricks. And as I said, I came into Hints about a year ago. So I'm still fresh meat on this. Um, but I came up, there, I, there are some tricks that we came up with within our team to make it easy to collaborate. Um, the first is um, to write and save your code in a text file. Um, if you're working with a collaborator or uh, a mentor and you need them to take a look at your code, um, they might not always have SAS or Sudan or Stata on their computer, but if you send them a text file, they can usually eyeball it and find that pesky miss missing semicolon. Um, so I typically do that. Um, oh, no, come back. Oh, technical difficulty. <laughs> I work in health tech, everybody. Um, <laughs> The other thing that I do is I save new versions of my code every day. So it sounds really intense to do that, but if you put a new date, so every day that I work on it, I put a new date on it. And that way, if I introduce something or I delete something and then I'm getting error messages that weren't there the day before, I can go back and compare or just copy paste um, rather than banging my head against my desk trying to find, again, for me it's usually a missing semicolon. For everyone, it's a different little thing. Um, the other thing is to annotate your code. Um, this is particularly helpful when you're working with collaborators. If you're creating a new variable, they don't have to look at the code and go, what are you doing here? They actually go, oh, you're creating an email doc variable. Um, and also, if you're coming back to something after a year or several months, that way you know which way is up on this as well, so you're not the blind leading the blind. Um, and finally, when you're merging your data, um, there's two things you need to keep in mind. The first is to check the, each code book to make sure, as we've said before, that you're harmonizing the variables appropriately. You're making sure that Seek Health Info and Health Info and Seek Info are all lining up and you're all creating a new variable in that new merge data set. You're not having to cobble together everything. And that everything is coded, so you're coding the missings appropriately. And the other thing that I'd like to note, um, and this is a tip that Dr. Moser gave me, is to make sure you check to make sure you merged your data appropriately. And one easy way to do this is, let's say you're working with uh, Hints2. You can run your analysis, like run just a cross tab with Hints2 and then run it with your merged hints and just subset it. And if you get the same results, you did the merge right. If you don't, you gotta go back and, and do some legwork. Um, so I'd like to point your attention to a couple of um, resources. We hand, give a handout that um, Dr. Moser put together today and we'll make that available to the webinar participants as well. It has some resources for doing these analyses. Um, but we also have a frequently asked question section of the Hints website that's very thorough. It talks about a lot of the stuff that we talked about today in text form. Um, sans examples, um, but it's really a great resource. Um, and if it's still, your question is still not answered there, you can go to the Contact Us page and send an email with any questions. Um, and as I said, I'm sure that, I, I shouldn't speak for the rest of the team, but if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm happy to help in any way I can. And with that, um, if we could have the team come up and we'll take one more round of questions before we call it a day. Thank you. And if anyone on webinar has questions, um, you can submit those as well, and we'll bring those up here. So thank you all for your presentation. Um, my question is about should there be any concerns or considerations we should take um, if you are interested in merging cycle five, which has like oversampling of a particular population with previous uh, cycles. Should we be concerned or is there not really, is the waiting done in a way that we shouldn't be concerned? So, so that's a good question. So um, as you allude to, sometimes the sampling was slightly different. We created different strata, uh, strata and oversampled, um, for example, we oversampled Appalachia for a couple iterations. So I've been assured by, um, by the sampling statisticians at Westat, who are, again, one of our main contractors, yes, because of the, uh, 
there is common sampling techniques across that that you can simply merge, as I was talking about, regardless which iterations, and line up those the final sample weight and create the 50 replicate weights, as uh, actually as, uh, Dr. Greenberg was showing. So no problem. Whatever iterations you want to combine, you can use the same technique. The, the nice thing about that is that each cycle, because of the replica weights and the post stratification techniques that we were talking about, they, they're self-correcting. So each cycle is independently representative and it takes all that sub, uh, oversampling into account. People want to know what your uh, rates are, Ali and <laughs> Rick. And you can pay me in coffee. Cheap. But I'm, I'm serious. I, we have, we ha do have a lot of code, and rather than reinvent the wheel, um, and I know that these, these were thrown up as uh, screen captures to make this easier for webinar and presentation. But um, I, I think I speak for the team when I say we're happy to share any code um, to make your life easy. We want you to use this data. We want you to publish on it and play with it and, and get dirty with it. And you know, if we can help with that in any way, um, please let us know. And just a reminder that uh, each iteration will have an analytics rec recommendation document with code for that. And then we do have two stats reports that are, you can get off the website um, that uh, give a lot of code about how to merge. So hopefully that at least give you a good start and then you can follow up with that. Do we have any more questions? Or if they come to you, you know where to find us. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hesse for a couple of concluding remarks. Wonderful. So again, I think a big round of applause for uh, Ali, who really put all this together and all of us. <clears throat> and for all those listening and watching this from future generations as they go back and uh, see what we talked about today, I think this has been incredibly exciting, wonderful work, and thank you all for being involved in that. And uh, what I like to do is, um, what, what I specifically want to do is thank you on behalf of all the survey participants, because it takes some time to answer these questions. Uh, and people do that because they really want to be sure the data they're contributing back be data that we can use to help make a difference in the world of cancer control and prevention. And so you folks are kind of helping fulfill that dream to them. So thank you very much for all of that. That's it.